It's hard to believe now, but there was a time when video game sequels didn't seem to take very long to make. In the NES generation, there was a Super Mario Bros. trilogy. In fact, there were two different Super Mario Bros. 2s. It was a simpler time. Games were simpler, smaller. It's understandable why things aren't like that now, even if people are chomping at the bit for a new Zelda game five years after Breath of the Wild. To an extent, though, you could see this shift as early as the 16-bit era. Super Mario World hit the 16-bit console wars at launch. And then... Half a decade later, there was Yoshi's Island. It's an absolute masterpiece of a game, but people will endlessly debate whether it even counts as a main series Mario follow-up. However, no one seems to have told Rare about this shift, who managed to put out an entire Donkey Kong Country trilogy within two years. It's not much of a surprise that they managed to steal some of Mario's thunder in the late 16-bit era. That said, they both feature crying baby characters, but that's a story for another day. Today's story's a little different. Once upon a time, there was a gorilla who kidnapped a girl at a construction site. He didn't know that that girl's boyfriend would become the most popular mascot in the history of video games. So, you know, things didn't end too well for him. As if to rub salt in the wound, a year later that same mascot, by this point definitively named, captured the gorilla, forcing his son to set out on a quest to save him and turn the tables once and for all. But that was Donkey Kong Jr. That was the past. This is the present, 1995. There's a new Donkey Kong in town. There's a new Donkey Kong Jr. It doesn't matter how your father feels about it. These aren't his. However, history has a habit of repeating itself. After taking the world by storm the previous year, the new DK was captured, bound, marginalized, humiliated. And for what? Just one of the greatest 16-bit platformers of all time? I'll take the trade-off. Welcome back to Donkey Kong Dissection. Has it been a year already? Well, I'm glad to be back, and I hope you are too. It's clear from my previous paragraph that I'm not here to mince words. Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest is one of my favorite games of all time. And as much as I love the first game, if I had to choose but one entry in the series, it would be this one. As such, I'm very, very excited to be talking about it. It also makes it the hardest DKC game for me to talk about. In some ways, it is easier to be critical, if only because it tends to be more entertaining than 45 minutes of, I love this, I love this, I love this. I think I managed to keep from falling into that crocodile pit, but for what it's worth, I love this. Nintendo had handed Rare the keys to the kingdom with Donkey Kong Country, and the results were certainly impressive. Aside from leaving the Super Nintendo audience agape, ha, ape, with its use of pre-rendered graphics, Donkey Kong Country was a huge financial success, ultimately becoming the third best-selling SNES game of all time. A follow-up was inevitable. The pressure might have been daunting, but according to producer-designer Greg Mails, we had started on DKC2 before we realized just how successful the first one was. As soon as the first one became successful, it became a formality. To that end, the team at Rare dusted off ideas they couldn't use in the first game and dreamed up countless new ideas. But perhaps the most significant idea of all was to sideline the title character himself. To again quote Greg Mails, We wanted to do something that would surprise people. The gameplay was set, but we wanted to introduce a new character. So we were either going to have to take Diddy out, or take the braver, bolder step of taking Donkey Kong out. In this iteration, rather than going directly after DK's banana horde, K. Rule kidnaps DK himself as leverage to get the banana horde. And that was a big risk. Rare had just introduced Donkey Kong for the 90s, only to relegate him to a cameo. At the same time, though, I'd argue that not playing as Donkey Kong in a Donkey Kong game was far more expected than actually getting to play as him. None of the entries in his original trilogy did that. And Donkey Kong Jr. had used the same kidnapped Kong scenario 13 years earlier. While 90s DK is shown to be tied up in the game itself, the box art features him in a cage, 
very similar to his arcade counterpart. Even the more vertical level design of DKC2 seems to mirror Donkey Kong Jr.'s climbing-focused gameplay. You can't tell me it's a coincidence how similar the climbing animation is. If anything, Donkey Kong Jr. took the bigger risk by turning its everyman hero into the villain. Here's the thing, though. If you sit down and think about it, what has the bigger legacy? Donkey Kong or Donkey Kong Jr.? Which game put Nintendo on the map? Which one to this day has the more recognizable sprites or locations or power-ups? It's definitely the original game. What happened to the character of Donkey Kong Jr.? Nothing. His name was too similar, his design too redundant. Donkey Kong Jr. is a great game, a successful game, no question. However, he is always in the shadow of the original Donkey Kong. Diddy Kong is the spiritual successor of Donkey Kong Jr. That's how he began, as a redesigned junior. And now, hot on the heels of a hugely successful game, Diddy gets to be the star in a game that mirrors Donkey Kong Jr. surprisingly closely. So if there was a risk in following the 80s pattern, it would be that Donkey Kong Country 2 might likewise be destined to ride the coattails of its predecessor's success while never quite measuring up. While Diddy Kong can find his starting point in Donkey Kong Jr., He's not Donkey Kong Jr. He ended up an entirely new character, a character created by Rare. So supplanting Donkey Kong, even a new Donkey Kong, with their original character could have blown up in their faces if this game hadn't gone over well. Could have been interpreted as an exceedingly arrogant act, Icarus flying too close to the sun and paying dearly. But in this case, it's a simple idea that perfectly fits into the character and story of the first game. After all, Diddy was the sidekick. It was not only his implicit role, it was explicitly stated in DK's fourth wall leaning world that Diddy longed to become a great video game hero like his idol, only to end up trapped in a barrel. What better follow up to that game, to that story, than to provide Diddy with an opportunity to do just that? What better role in which to recast the curmudgeonly Cranky Kong than as both the heckler who insists Diddy will never pull it off as well as the perfect seasoned expert to judge whether he's ultimately successful. Donkey Kong Jr. came out of nowhere. Nothing in the first game hints at his existence. Diddy Kong was practically introduced with the expectation he'd get a game of his own. That's always been the weird thing about the Donkey Kong games. They're certainly not serious or densely written. The story is less of a focus than the gameplay. The story is less of a focus than fourth wall breaking quips. However, when compared to Mario, this has a bit more meat to its story. Most of the time with Mario, the same dominoes are knocked down, set back up, and knocked down again. Donkey Kong Country 2 truly feels like a sequel, not only in gameplay, but in narrative. K. Rule has a different evil plan. The action jumps from the peaceful Donkey Kong Island to the far more nefarious home of the enemy, Crocodile Isle. Even the first world is the same ship upon which the last game concluded now scuttled and broken, clearly referencing the history between these factions. The world and the characters within it have subtly changed with the passage of time. Rather than sitting on his porch wistfully regaling all comers with the superiority of the past, Cranky Kong has made it his full-time job, opening a monkey museum full of memorabilia. In this game, we're introduced to his wife, Wrinkly, who runs the Kong College. The school exists both to teach game controls and to allow players to save the game, which replaces Candy Kong in her pink bathing suit. Another new Kong ally, Swanky Kong, doles out extra lives through a trivia game show. Funky is pretty much exactly the same as before, although I am quick to admit he is the one character who disputes my assertion of time moving forward. I mean, his new airport looks pretty cool, but how did he go from a jet airplane barrel to a biplane? That sense of progression always sticks out most to me in regards to the enemies. A few of them return from the original Donkey Kong Country. Most of the ones who do are retooled in some way. For example, in the first game, there were Neckies and Mini Neckies. The former were large vultures that flapped across the screen. The latter were tiny vultures who would spit coconuts. Now the former are gone. The latter are bedecked with pirate bandanas and they dive bomb your characters. They've grown up and expanded their arsenal, stepping into a more prominent role, 
just like Diddy. The helmeted clumps have been repurposed into projectile launching cannons. Or at least that's what the always fun manual asserts. Swanky's trivia game doesn't seem to think it's the same Kremlin, so who knows. Those enemy examples might make it obvious that DKC2 has taken the Gangplank Galleon idea and run with it, casting the Kremlins as cutthroat pirates. King K. Rule is now the blunderbuss sporting Captain K. Rule. I certainly hope the Clomps aren't critters who were forced to sever their own legs just to fit the theme. That would be kind of twisted. As I stated, the entire first world takes place on a pirate ship, but the theme persists in various ways throughout the game. However, it never smothers the game. There are plenty of other aesthetic themes. The fact of the matter is, pirates have never really interested me all that much. I don't necessarily dislike pirate stories or aesthetics. They're fine. I've just been sort of neutral towards them. Were this nothing but pirates, I might find it a bit much. Here, it's just enough to provide a slightly darker twinge to the game's tone and set the precedent for other backdrops far zanier than anything the original game presented. Like amusement parks and giant beehives, fetid swamps and crystal-covered mines. Have I mentioned this game is gorgeous? The Kongs even have realistically textured fur this time around. The Kremlings are no longer a ragtag collection of evil animals. They're organized under a common costume party theme. They've been defeated before, but have come back stronger than ever, pulling out all the stops. They've struck a major blow against the Kongs and have retreated back to their own island, defending it as DK was defending his last time. Again, it's not deep, but it definitely feels as though the story, thin as it is, is being pushed to its logical continuation. I've been holding this back for long enough. Don't forget the other half of that Greg Mail's quote. The main impetus for ditching Donkey was to add another character in his place. Presumably they didn't want to complicate the tag team dynamic of the first game by using three Kongs. And just imagine how cluttered a game with, say, five playable Kongs would be. The result was a new partner for Diddy, Dixie Kong, and she is just as amazing as Diddy, if not more so. In a true Eve was made from Adam's rib mentality, Dixie was designed using Diddy as a starting point. They removed his tail, changed around a few features, and voila! New character! It's certainly not the level of contrast present between DK and Diddy, however the design doesn't mean that Dixie is simply Diddy in pink. I don't know what it is about video game heroines between these franchises, but Dixie borrows heavily from the Princess of Super Mario Bros. 2 playbook giving her a much floatier jump that allows for more precise platforming. But even that doesn't make Dixie derivative. The princess could hold her jump for a few moments before being forced to land. Dixie twirls her long, blonde ponytail like a helicopter blade to stay aloft. As long as the Y button is held and there is sky below her, Dixie can control her descent indefinitely. It's an amazing new skill that lends itself to the game's greater emphasis on verticality, and gives Dixie a far better competitive balance to Diddy's speed than DK's strength did in the first game. Both characters are immensely useful depending on the situation. The helicopter spin is hilariously unrealistic, which is quite a departure from the more naturalistic tone of the first game. It doesn't even stop there. Dixie's entire move set is tied to her ponytail. She flies with it, she attacks with it, she lifts barrels with it. It is prehensile and it is a mission statement for the game. Diddy's Conquest is far more willing to have fun with its characters than be realistic. The relatively humble wooden stands and cabins of the first game are replaced with schoolhouses and game show sets. There's no longer a hand-painted exit sign marking the end of each level. Diddy and Dixie hop on a strength target to win a prize, pulling out boom boxes and electric guitars to celebrate their successes. The kids are in charge now. But they're 90s kids, so they never let themselves get too worked up about anything. They're detached, and they don't care about what you think. I think that comes across most obviously when they go into their bored idol animations. They have better things to do than listen to you. Diddy wants to juggle balls, Dixie... For decades I thought she was sucking on her toes, but I think she's actually blowing on her toenail polish. As big of a deal as the Next Generation theme was in the last game, as personified by the character of Cranky, it still seemed to mix its message, presenting the new DK as an established hero, 
despite never having appeared in a game before. Cranky rubs in that DK will never be the hero he is, but he's more than ready to hand over the banana horde in light of DK's capture. As far as the characters are concerned, DK is their one and only hope to ward off a Kremlin attack. Rare's Donkey Kong struggles to balance being an established hero and an untested upstart. That makes Diddy and Dixie far more appropriate characters to carry the anxiety of living up to the previous generation. They are both presented as in over their heads, building each other up to reassure themselves that they are ready for this. While Diddy is undeniably the star of this game, the two leads present a true partnership rather than a hero and sidekick. And since they are teased to be romantically involved, that's as it should be. But because of that, there's a consistent feeling of working without a net, which makes all these moments of personality shining through feel all the more satisfying. They're in enemy territory, but in spite of all the danger, they're still going to let themselves cut loose and have fun, even if the representative of the older generation they're trying to impress is a dirty, dirty misogynist. Once again, I've spent a lot of time on narrative, design, and theming, and have barely touched the game part of the game, the thing that I'm usually playing. Welcome to Donkey Kong Dissection, that's how it works. Even so, it's about that time to start looking at the game mechanics. Donkey Kong Country 2 performs a rare... Ha! Feat. In a way, absolutely everything from the first game has changed in some way. But at the same time, nothing has changed enough that it prevents the game from being instantly recognizable as a sequel to the original. Just like its predecessor, DKC2 is a multi-stage action platformer where the goal is to reach the end of each level, with a boss at the end of each world. Bananas earn extra lives, which themselves are balloons, now ditty-shaped instead of donkey-shaped. Kong letters are still collected for an extra life, but they've been supercharged. They do the exact same thing, but they're big now and animated. Each Kong can be switched at will as long as you have both. Each Kong scampers off after taking a single hit. Lost Kongs are found in DK barrels. That in itself is rather funny given that the whole conceit of this game is a Kong napping. When DK is captured, it's for keeps. Yet for some reason, when Diddy and Dixie are caught, they're tossed away to be forgotten. Come on, Kremlings, go all in with this. I guess it wouldn't be a very long game if they did, though. In nearly every regard, DKC2 takes elements from the first game and adds to them. There's really only one gameplay element the sequel takes away. Weight. In the first game, Donkey and Diddy control differently because of their respective sizes. Donkey is bigger, but slower. Able to take out enemies Diddy can't. Since Dixie's design is based off of Diddy, they're both small fries. Neither is stronger than the other. It's the only game of the trilogy that doesn't utilize that feature. The big, muscly Kremlin this time around is Cruncha, and neither Kong can jump on him. In fact, trying to once makes him mad, and trying a second time damages you. The lack of weight isn't a problem since the game more than makes up for it in different ways. Diddy is faster while Dixie has her helicopter spin. I compared her earlier to the princess, but while she was always my favorite character as a kid, now that I'm older, I find she has less and less utility. Her floaty jump easy mode isn't worth the sacrifice in speed. I can't say the same for Dixie. She's awesome no matter what your skill level. What's funny is that since Diddy's moveset is already established, the developers have to hand off some of DK's stronger traits to Dixie. Diddy retains his too weak to hold barrels over his head but can use front barrels as a shield mechanic, so Dixie has to hold barrels over her head using her ponytail. In the original game, the actions were so basic that some of the buttons didn't even need to be used. In fact, so few buttons were required that two separate buttons, A and Select, were used for the same function, to switch Kongs. You could literally choose whichever method you preferred. You no longer have that choice in Donkey Kong Country 2. The A button is now needed for a new technique. If you have both Kongs and press A, the reserve Kong hops on the active Kong's shoulders. This is the team throw mechanic. With a tap of Y, you can throw your partner, allowing you to attack enemies from a distance, or kill your partner if you're not careful, collect out of reach items, and even collectively access higher platforms. I don't really know how the other Kong comes along, like they're somehow tethered. 
This isn't Knuckles Chaotix, a game I've never played. I mean, I also don't know how Diddy follows Dixie at the same pace when she descends with her helicopter twirl. He really should be taking a leap of faith and dying horribly, followed by Dixie gently landing five minutes later. Eh, it's a video game. Just as its style pushes against realism, so too does its gameplay. It embraces being a video game, including far more concepts because they make for fun gameplay, rather than because they make sense. Wind mechanics blow in from the Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2, be it horizontal wind to propel you forward, or vertical wind to push you ever upward. A giant Kremlin ghost chases you in a haunted library? A haunted library roller coaster? With a countdown indicating when it gets to attack you. Water temperature has to be altered to be safe. The pirate motif and its giant rigging structures create perfect excuses for climbing. That continues into the Zinger Hive levels, the walls of which are covered in sticky, climbable honey. And several animal buddies are designed with distinct platforming in mind. Rambi, On Guard, and Squawks return from the previous game. The first two remain relatively unchanged, except they can now perform charge attacks by holding A. Squawks has gained quite a few pounds, but his makeover isn't just aesthetic. No longer does he hold a flashlight, he carries the Kongs, flying in ways that useless Espresso could only dream of, and he can spit eggs to boot. This allows for completely vertical level structures. There's even a crappy purple variant in one level that can do nothing but fall slowly. Using Dixie is much easier. Even the player's guide tells you to dump him. Just forget him. They took him out of the oven too soon. Come back in 1996. As for the new guys, Rattly basically takes over Winky's role as the high jumper. Apparently Winky's long body requiring a huge hitbox is why he didn't come back. But Rattly's upright position and corkscrew tail allow him to charge up like a spring for a super jump. He's a huge improvement over Winky, and I never had a problem with Winky. Glimmer the Anglerfish becomes the new Squawks, taking over flashlight duties in an underwater level. Clapper the Seal fills in the other support role. You jump on him and he'll spit out... Spit? Magic spit? It cools water, turning boiling water into swimmable water, and biting fish-infested water into crossable ice. And then there's Squitter, the googly-eyed, sneaker-wearing spider. He can't jump on enemies... yet. Instead, he shoots them down with attack webs, completely changing how you interact with the world. Turning a handicap into a new asset like that would probably be enough for a single animal buddy on its own. But he can also shoot webs that create temporary floating platforms. Platform webs only last for a limited time and are restricted to two at a time. Navigating giant chasms can require quite a bit of skill. This gives him utility both in horizontal chasms and vertical shafts. A wide range of movement and long range attack? He is the best new animal buddy in the game and hey look at that! He uses A, he uses Y, he uses L and R. We finally found a Donkey Kong Country character that gives the Super Nintendo controller a workout. Kind of a minor change here, but in the first game, while you could only keep animal buddies within the level you found them, you could ride them all the way to the end. Donkey Kong Country 2 introduces no animal signs that cause the animals to explode into prizes if you try to carry them past it. No end of level target for you, Rambi. Seems rather controlling of the designers, but DKC2 does sometimes feature multiple animals in the same level, so this shift makes some degree of sense. Still pretty gruesome, though. To return to that idea of fun video game concepts trumping realism, in the first Donkey Kong Country you found your animal buddies in crates. That's true here, too, for a time. But in the third world you encounter a new barrel, one that transforms you into the animal. That is definitely pushing the bounds of reality. The rules of the game change a bit when you become the animal. Rather than taking a hit and having it run off, a la Yoshi, your backup Kong becomes a backup hit. Get hit twice and you're dead. My opinion of this development has evolved as I've grown. See, in the first game there were bonus areas you could reach by getting three of the same animal token. It allowed you to play exclusively as the animal for a brief period of time. 
As a kid, I thought that was pretty cool, despite the fact that the stages weren't all that interesting and did nothing but break up the flow of the level whenever you were forced to participate in them. So when I realized that the DKC2 let you be the animals in the real levels, I was thrilled. Being the animals is so cool. Then I got a little older and jaded. I tried to deduce the cynical motives behind this. I came to the conclusion that, oh, they suckered me. What's really the difference? Whether the Kong is riding it or not, it's still the same thing, who cares? It's still fun, but it's not the revolutionary difference my little kid brain thought it was. But then that brain finished developing and I finally realized exactly what the difference was. As rideable mounts, the animal buddies could only be used in limited ways. They were fun to have and could make challenges a bit easier, but levels had to be designed in such a way that they could be completed regardless of whether you had the animal or not. Compulsory transformation barrels mean that levels can be designed with the animal's specific abilities in mind, which in turn expands the scope of abilities that can be designed. Long vertical mine shafts and floorless bramble mazes could not have existed in Donkey Kong Country because there's no way for the Kongs to traverse them. But now, Rattly can make those giant leaps, Rambi can make bridges out of spiked enemies, Squitter can web his way across endless bottomless pits. This is a genuinely big deal, and it provides so much more diversity to the gameplay. The only time I feel shortchanged is with Squawks. That's not because Squawks isn't fun to play as, he is. Because all of Squawks' levels are designed around flight, and therefore all of his sections are impossible to perform with just the Kongs, there is practically no difference between riding Squawks and being Squawks. When you ride Squawks and take a hit, you lose a Kong. Lose both and you die. That's the same mechanic as when you transform. In fact, it's better to ride Squawks. The Kongs lose their hitboxes, so you can actually rest on Brambles, which you can't do when you're Squawks alone. I'm sorry to say it, but transformed Squawks is lesser Squawks. <laughs> A gameplay feature I have not yet talked about and didn't talk about at all when I covered the first game is the bosses. I don't know, I feel it's rather common low-hanging fruit to make fun of the bosses of Donkey Kong Country. I felt they were neither important enough nor detrimental enough to discuss. Yes, they are larger versions of regular enemies that don't take terribly long to fight. But I never had a problem with them. They serve their purpose. This is not really a boss-focused series. It's about the platforming. Bosses are just one more obstacle, a way to mix things up. I never see anyone complain about the endless parade of stomp on their heads three times bosses of Super Mario Bros. 3, so I don't see the issue with DKC's bosses. Regardless, Donkey Kong Country 2 does a far better job. Each boss is more complex with unique arenas and methods of defeating them. Cleaver scared the ever-loving crap out of me as a kid, and took me far longer to beat the first time than I care to admit. King Zing is a multi-phase upgrade over the first game's Queen Bee, an airborne battle that utilizes Squawks instead of the Kongs. The first boss, Crow, returns as a fearsome ghost later in the game with a multi-screen vertical level full of hazardous climbing. And like with King K. Rule, Captain K. Rule challenges you to a huge gauntlet, daring you to stay alive through increasingly complex attack chains before you get a chance to hit back. Suffice it to say, even if you were disappointed with Donkey Kong Country's bosses, Donkey Kong Country 2 won't let you down. This is the moment I've been waiting for. You probably remember that my biggest problem with the first game was how it incorporated bonus content. It felt like Rare wanted to add elements of exploration, but struggled to do so in a way that didn't break the pace or feel underwhelming for completionists. Well, one of Donkey Kong Country 2's biggest improvements is how it completely overhauls bonuses. First off, extra lives are shunted off to Swanky Kong's games, where they belong. If you need more lives, head over there. Levels still have hidden bonus rooms. Some are behind breakable walls like last time, others further the pirate motif by forcing you to carry a cannonball to a cannon somewhere in the stage. Most of them are in blast barrels, now emblazoned with B for bonus. Before we even get into the bonuses, let me just say how much more satisfying it is to find them this time around. 
the cannonballs in particular are emblematic of this better approach to bonuses. Their performance-based challenges, that of not losing the cannonball, instead of a where am I supposed to go nightmare. Now, I'm not saying the difficulty is bad, I like to be challenged. But I also don't care for impossibly cryptic stuff like finding a bonus room within a bonus room, or having to backtrack through an entire level in a game that otherwise consists of completely linear platforming. Finding the bonuses in Donkey Kong Country 2 will test both your skills and your power of observation, but nearly all of them seem fair. There's always something to clue you in, a configuration of enemies that causes you to wonder what you can do with that, something just off camera to make you think, I should see where that goes. Even something as obscure as walking through a wall is usually marked by a single banana. There's a spot where you have to follow Cannon's blasted cannonball backwards so it can open a bonus room for you, and it's marked by a giant banana arrow letting you know, hey, there's a reason to go back. You have to put together what that means and successfully keep pace with the cannonball so it doesn't despawn. These are so much more satisfying than what Donkey Kong Country provided, and thread that needle perfectly to make them feel like they belong in a quick-paced, skill-based platformer. The only exception I would make to that is these water levels. Yeah, water levels have bonuses now too, no rest for the weary. I love the aesthetic of navigating these sunken pirate ship holds. They're just kind of confusing if you're looking for everything. It's hard to keep track of where you've been. Looking for things is especially frustrating in the level where the water heats up after a few seconds. It also doesn't help that these levels employ a lot of false walls to hide goodies. I usually spend my entire time bumping against every wall hoping I stumble into something. Even so, I can live with them. However you find bonuses, they whisk you off into one of three types. Gone are the slots and the rooms filled with bananas. Now you're either navigating an obstacle course, defeating all the enemies, or collecting a predetermined number of stars, all within a time limit. Unlike its predecessor, this game doesn't punish you by taking away the bonus room if you fail it the first time nor does it give you credit simply for finding it. Every bonus is a challenge you must successfully complete. Despite only having three different types, the game devises so many variations on those common themes that they're always fun. Often, they're a distilled version of whatever the level's theme is. If you're navigating heavy winds in the level, you have to contend with the wind while defeating enemies. If it's an animal buddy-focused level, you need to use that animal's skills in the bonus. Sometimes you need to use a collection of barrels and cannonballs to take out enemies. Sometimes you need to use your team throw. Again, the focus is never taken away from the platforming, as the bonuses are just platforming challenges on steroids, and with a hectic time limit. It's a much tighter focus. So if you don't fill up your pantsless monkey pockets with bananas and balloons, what do you get? Well, for each completed bonus room, you are rewarded with a Krim coin. What do Krim coins do? Well, nothing. At first. You can't spin them in the Kong shops. Instead, starting with the second world, each world contains a Clubba's kiosk. Clubba is a beefy club-wielding Kremlin, and palette swap of the third world's boss, who guards a golden barrel. If you pay him 15 Krim coins, he'll look the other way and let you use it. Side note, I swear there was a brief time as a kid, I thought the first kiosk only required 8 Krim coins. I think that was because I got the pieces of eight message and wasn't reading carefully enough. Anyway, each of these golden barrels takes you to a level in the Kremlin Lost World. Only by collecting every single Krim coin will you be able to access all the Lost World levels. Now that is what I'm talking about. Here is a motivating incentive to seek out all the bonuses, as if they weren't fun and challenging enough on their own, they reward you by granting you access to more fun and challenging levels. And make no mistake, these are by far the most challenging levels in the game, and I'm getting excited just saying that. Don't even get me started on Animal Antics, which puts you through a marathon of every rideable animal buddy. If you've played this game at any point in your life, you already know where this is going. It's all manageable enough until you get to the Squawk section, which mixes flying, enemies, brambles, and wind. Even if you're lucky enough to get through all of it, there's still an entire rattly section left to go. And it's not that hard, but you're probably on your last hit, so you make one little mistake, clip into one spike the wrong way, 
and you're going back. Not back to the rattly section, not back to the squawk section, but to the squitter section. Have fun doing all that again. Oh, I will have fun. I might be screaming at my TV the whole time, but this is exactly what I come to these games for. As if five new hard as insert clever simile- oh, I never updated that placeholder. As if those levels weren't enough, completing all of them grants you access to another showdown with Captain K. Rule, and defeating him unlocks the final ending of the game. This is the kind of reward the first game was completely lacking. It shows exactly how much Rare learned going into this second game. But that's not all as far as completionist content goes. I haven't even mentioned the video game Hero Coins. Yeah, another coin! Cranky Kong expands his narrative role into a gameplay role, which is brilliant. He's not just the guy stuck in a room lobbing insults at your inability to become a video game hero. He's going to test you. He places his own coin in every level and they are hidden much farther off the beaten path. It takes a very keen eye to spot them, but again, they're usually fair. The most costly are the few that require quick timing as prizes at the end of level target. You make one mistake there and congratulations, you're doing the entire level all over again. There's really only one hero coin that could be considered anywhere near as cryptic as the worst of the original Donkey Kong Country. In the second world level canon's claim, there is a hero coin that's found in a bonus room. And yes, this is the only time in the game that happens. I'll still take it over this. At least you only have to walk slightly to the right to find it. I really don't know if I'm an objective judge though. This is definitely a game in which I had my nose stuck in the official player's guide the entire time. And while I still couldn't tell you where every secret is off the top of my head, I do know this one, and I wonder how easy it'd be to find if I didn't have that burned into my brain. Collecting the hero coins provides less of a tangible reward than the Krim coins, but I do think it's satisfying to stand above the likes of Mario, Yoshi, and Link. Seriously, Link should at least be higher than Yoshi. As a true video game hero. Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest takes the one major weakness of Donkey Kong Country and fixes it in every conceivable way, and it does improve on most of the things the first game did well. Reviewing this game is largely an exercise in comparison, but doing so makes me worry that it'll come across like the original is just crap. There are a few things I prefer about DKC. Despite all the new barrel types the sequel adds, I think the original game has far more nail-biting barrel cannon sections. I slightly prefer the water levels not having bonuses. The Kongs celebrating their victory over every level was cute and charming, and I hate that the second game rushes past that. Then again, I guess their celebrations at the target more than make up for it. The first game had more variety with Kremlin death sounds. Now everyone sounds like a big hulking brute. And I loved that the locations, the structures of the Helper Kongs were visible on every map, rather than just existing as icons. It made the world feel more real. Even so, in a lot of these cases that doesn't mean DKC2 is worse for not doing things this way. As a matter of fact, it ensures the original game maintains its own identity, rather than simply feeling like a beta version of this game. And I like that. Including its wacky amusement parks, crystal mine shafts, haunted woods, and giant beehives, there are a lot of beautiful locations filled with challenging obstacles that keep this game fixed in my memory even 27 years later. Those memories make up my childhood. But if anything encapsulates those memories and the feelings they evoke, it's the music. Come on, you would have known where this was going even without the title card. David Wise returns to compose DKC2's music, and I'm not exactly blowing anyone's mind here by stating it's probably one of my favorite video game soundtracks of all time. Everyone says DKC2 is darker than its predecessor, and a lot of that has to do with the pirate motif, the gloomy castles, and the generally higher level of difficulty. A lot of that is true. Let's just admit it though, it is the music. 
I talked last time about the balance of tone, where despite the silly monkeys doing silly monkey things, aspects like the score ground it so that it never comes across as too saccharine. More than any other Donkey Kong game, this score pushes that balance from levity to gravity. I am so incredibly grateful some clueless executive along the way didn't insist, the game is funny and silly, the music needs to be funny and silly too. Whenever I hear this music, my heart almost aches, and in a good way, it's cathartic. Don't believe me? To anyone who has any familiarity with this game, all I have to say are two words. Stickerbush Symphony. This piece of music is used for the Bramble levels, some of the most punishing stages in the game, certainly enough to make it memorable. But the instrumentation, while slow, is almost plaintive. The music isn't beating you into submission with how hard the gameplay is. It's almost lamenting your struggles alongside you, while reminding you of the beauty you'll discover once you get good. Whenever I hear this, I'm taken back to the first time I ever played Bramble Blast. It was a Friday night, TGIF was over, and I was banging my head against a wall, stuck in this maze of barrel cannons. In a Snowbound Land reminds me of Christmas at nine years old, picking up the latest Archie comics. And I know Stickerbush Symphony is everyone's favorite, but I have to go slightly against the grain again because Forest Interlude edges it out ever so slightly for me. Just like Stickerbush Symphony, it's peaceful and beautiful, but so haunting and spooky at the same time. It's the lamentations of the spirits of the forest, and I just want to stay among those hollowed out trees forever. I could go on the same way with nearly every piece of music. There's always some hook that grabs your emotions and elevates jumping around on a googly-eyed spider and collecting bananas into something you almost believe is meaningful. So with all of that said, do I have any problems with this game? I mean, it's pretty much perfect, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, I guess I have one. The Crim Coins and Hero Coins in the game are unique. There are a set amount of them in the game. That's not true for the third type of coins, Banana Coins. They're scattered throughout levels in fixed locations and respawn in levels just like bananas and balloons, and they are used to pay the Kong family members for their services. Want to play the trivia game? Hand over coins. Want to get a hint? Pay me please! Want to save your game? Hope you can afford it! Honestly, I'd be fine with it in regards to hints and the bonus bonanza. You might even remember that I defended limited access to save points in the first game. But I don't think adding another obstacle to that is fair, especially given that unlike the other coins, banana coins aren't tracked in your progress. Whenever you start a game, your coin count, just like your banana count and life count, is reset. At the end of the day, they aren't a huge obstacle, they are fairly plentiful in stages, so it's not hard to build up a stock of them. And since I have played the game for over a quarter of a century, I know that nearly every wrinkly location offers the first save for free, and every funky location offers airplane rides after the first one for free. Because of that, I hold off on saving until I have to, and I use every funky's flights immediately so I don't have to worry about money when I'm backtracking for the Lost World. It doesn't cause me any problems anymore. It is unnecessary busy work that I shouldn't have to be thinking about. And I don't think there was any way to make this system work for the applications they wanted it to. Either the game doesn't save banana coins and you potentially find yourself in a needlessly precarious situation because you can't save when, say, your mom calls you to dinner. But on the flip side, if the game does keep track of your coins, you build up a huge surplus of them and there's never a point you even think about them because you always have far more than you need. My point is, this isn't an RPG. There's not enough in this game to buy to warrant having an in-game currency, and locking saving behind a paywall is a needless frustration that has nothing to do with your gameplay skill, except to punish beginners who might get stuck on every new level and would need to save more frequently. It comes across as adding more stuff to collect for the sake of collecting, rather than because the game needs it. It's quite telling that paying to save is limited solely to this entry in the trilogy. But that's the one major complaint I have, which isn't even that major at all. 
there is an incredible amount of this game that works, and it was a veritable success, becoming the second best-selling game of 1995 and the sixth best-selling Super Nintendo game of all time. The one game that did beat it in 95? Yoshi's Island. So I guess Yoshi does deserve that spot as a video game hero. True, it did not surpass the sales figures of its predecessor. After all, DKC got a year's head start, ended up being bundled with the console, and... Oh yeah, its revolutionary graphics took the world by storm. But to turn it back to Greg Mails one more time, I think the first one was better in terms of WoW Factor, but Donkey Kong Country 2 was a better game in terms of the gameplay. And that rather succinctly sums up the question I opened on. Is Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest another Donkey Kong Jr.? Popular and well-regarded in its time, but forever in the shadow of its predecessor? No, I don't think so. Remember that some more modern reviewers have criticized Donkey Kong Country for coasting on that wow factor. For being overrated when it comes to its gameplay. I've never seen that said for Donkey Kong Country 2. I don't know if I've ever encountered anyone who has played it and not loved it, not considered it one of the greatest games of all time. Donkey Kong Country got the foot in the door. Donkey Kong Country 2 proved that wasn't a fluke, that its few cracks were still sitting atop a solid foundation. Diddy Kong proved he could be a hero, and Donkey Kong Country 2 proved that Rare could deliver a masterpiece. Donkey Kong Country 2 stands in the shadow of no one. Thanks so much for watching. I know it's been a while since my video on Donkey Kong Country, so I appreciate your patience. When Donkey Kong Dissection returns, it will be with Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble. But like this one, it will be a video that will be done when it's ready. I want to make it the best I can, and I have regular uploads that I have to put out too. It's thanks to patrons like these that allow me to have the time to devote to these bigger, longer projects. If you'd like to join them, I'd greatly appreciate it, but I appreciate just as much your views, your likes, your comments, your subscriptions. And if you like what you saw here, be sure to check out the original Dissection series, Dragon Ball Dissection, or Mighty Morphin Zhu Rangers, my series that compares Mighty Morphin Power Rangers to its Japanese inspiration. I'll see you next time!